says it's going so hello hello. hello jacob let me uh make sure yeah that's that's got whoever's speaking is now sort of full center screen <laughs> right welcome to the podcast which does not have a name yet ah i always like to be anonymous <laughs> it's very organically developing and Excellent. it doesn't actually have a logo yet so you're really in at the ground zero of this thing found but a member <laughs> i'm very it. excited to, to get it off the ground and start having conversations like this so what's the focus of the podcast is it going to be very wide ranging or is it, it got a particular yes. narrow theme? Uh, it's going to be very wide ranging it's really focused on making sense of the world today mm -hmm. and my kind of journey doing that so i'm going to be talking to lots of people uh, about culture technology um it's definitely going to be a focus on practice uh -huh. which is probably going to come into our conversation today Sounds good. And um, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. It's kind of open-ended, really. Sounds, sounds yeah, like, like, like something I would like to start myself one day, but never quite get around to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we met at a conference, or actually, we met at a gong bath. That's exactly not, right, yes. Not something that I frequent often. Same. Um, it was my, my first. My, my, I, I popped my gong bath cherry with you. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i just felt like there was a good foundation for a conversation uh already there when we had a quick chat and i've not had someone to have a real uh deep conversation about yoga with i've sort of been in the position of being the sort of intermediate uh yoga practitioner talking to other people who are not really doing it uh, um, yeah so it's nice for me to be on the, on the other side of, of talking to someone who knows a bit more than me. Well, we'll see. <laughs> hope so. But I uh, hope I can sit, shed some light on your questions anyway, whatever mm. it may be. Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of sort of directions we can take it in. And I've got a lot of um, sort of ideas about how yoga might uh, relate to, to other things like embodiment and what, what it really means to have a practice. Mm. your life and that kind of thing but i thought it might be best to sort of just start out a bit with you and how you've sort of arrived uh. in this conversation <laughs> talking to me about yoga and um you know you you've done quite a bit of talks and writing about the history of yoga yes and sort of recontextualizing it not as a kind of west coast um middle class housewives kind of thing and more of a kind of um grounded tradition yeah i mean yoga obviously has a past but um i mean it's of use to us in the present and um you know the commercial marketplace of the yoga industrial complex is where a lot of us first encountered it my, myself included in some ways i mean uh, i got into a regular practice through going to a class that i paid money for that was taught by a white guy in bristol so that's that's that was my introduction to getting Mm. more integrated going but before that i'd spent time in india hanging out with wild men that's probably about the only way i could describe them um they're known in modern context as sadhus and uh, really that just means sort of holy man wise man and uh effectively it, yeah it's a it's a sort of synonym for being a half naked beggar who walks around communing with the absolute um sometimes fired by a hash pipe so I, mm. I found that incredibly mm -hmm. alluring in my early 20s as, as a way of engaging with religion. It didn't seem like most of the forms I'd encountered so far. Um, and I also met a load of Western hippies who were my parents' age who were you know, quite plugged into that scene. So yeah. I found myself at big gatherings of you know, what were traditional yogis in, in a sense, um, although quite how traditional what they do is, is open to question as well. Um, but certainly it was, it was a totally different vibe to anything I'd previously associated with yoga. So in some ways I was, was more exposed to that than, than I was to physical practice in the first place. And then I came at the physical practice through, I guess, you know, taking some of those ideas one step too far. Um, I had this fantasy that I could uh, facilitate a large gathering of people with a similarly sort of transformative, transcendent agenda 
Mm. Um, in the former Yugoslavia, I organized a music festival on an island in Belgrade that was supposed to be you know, coming together of all the young people of the region and would suddenly kickstart a whole new tourist industry around music festivals that would attract all the young people from Western Europe to culturally exchange with their former Eastern Bloc brethren, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, slowly over the last 15 years, that's actually come to pass. But our festival turned into mm. a right mess, got basically robbed by our security guards who were effectively the mafia and uh, I just took too many drugs and span out so <laughs> I wound up in a yoga class trying to find my way back to my body I'd gone you know I'd lost my mind completely it wasn't a controlled yogic transcendence of the mind it was you know just a, a meltdown and mm. uh, going to a yoga class you know gave me gave me something to hang on to <laughs> so in a way it helped me also to make sense of why what I'd been doing before wasn't really yoga <laughs> it, was, uh, it was just getting high Kind of, yes. <laughs> Which is its thing. <laughs> uh, maybe we can explore. There is a kind of connection there um, with early yoga and the hashish and um, cannabis in northern India. But um, Well, that's very interesting. Let's just jump in on there at the yeah. moment. I mean, I'd always assumed that that kind of went back to, to, to yeah, who knows when, given that a lot of the early Indian texts, uh, the, the Vedas, um, talk about people who were inspired by the consumption of a strange substance that's known as soma that has yet to really be identified. It's obviously in some ways psychoactive. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I did, I did, I did, Joe Rogan, actually. <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm fascinated with it. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a thing. And there's a guy at SOAS where I recently studied the history of yoga academically. I said recently, it's now about six years ago, but uh, a guy called Matthew Clark, who has been giving quite a few talks at psychedelic uh, symposia in London about his theory that effectively Soma was like ayahuasca. It's a combination of plants that, uh, mm. that had a quite, you know, sort of transcendent uh, effect uh, that, that led to, to, to great visionary inspiration. Um, However, there's not really a connection between that and the cannabis smoking. Some of Matthew's other research has shown that that really got introduced to northern India for six, seven hundred years ago by Sufis. And uh, actually, mm. it wasn't a tradition even of smoking in India until the Portuguese bought tobacco. So <laughs> a lot of the history of yoga is about these weird cross-cultural exchanges that don't yes. fit the narrative of what, you know, if you go to India and want to be told sort of the true story of yoga, it all goes back you know, to the timeless origins when Shiva created all the yoga postures and everything since then has just unfolded seamlessly. Um, and it's just not yes. true any more than the idea that what you encounter in you know, a gym necessarily has anything to do with yoga. It, it, it's, it could just so be a workout. Northern India was uh, really a melting pot of different cultures. Obviously the Absolutely. Sufis come in with the, the Mughal empire kind of from the West yes um reaching out and then you have i mean i'm not too schooled up but you've obviously got a mixture of uh, hindu cultural context there and buddhism also originated in that area yeah um and of course the the mughals uh were always ruling as a minority over these groups so it's a kind of uniquely cultural melting pot situation Absolutely. where this practice has emerged and I think in some ways that goes back way, way, you know, into, into prehistory almost. Um, we don't really know who came from where, when, but there was certainly mm. some migration from Central Asia. And there's a lot of commonalities between the Sanskrit language and the Vedic religion and uh, ideas and concepts and, and, and you know, even, even the whole sort of structure of religion, of, 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 you know, ancient Persia. So it's not a popular thing to say in India. It's uh, often... It, it suggested that to, 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 to claim that there might have been any input from outside into the creation of the Vedas is, is, is a Western construct all designed to legitimize imperial occupation of the country. You know, all the good stuff comes from outside to civilize the barbarians. Mm. Um, but it does seem that, you know, that there's been an exchange of ideas for as far back as we can trace. Even there's a civilization before the time of the Vedas, the Indus Valley civilization, about which we know very little other than you know, there's a few artifacts that were dug up. Um, and obviously quite advanced civilization in some way. One ways. of the it, earliest ones, right? Yes, trading with Mesopotamia and uh, you know, possibly even ancient Egypt. Um, so you know, definitely a lot of exchange in various forms been going on for a very long time. And it's difficult now in the current context to try and sort of unravel that from what's you know, culturally appropriate if in, in the modern jargon. Uh, what counts as sort of positive cross-pollination and cross-fertilization and what needs to be sort of stamped out as a a, you know, 
a misdirecting of these 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 original influences um, mm-hmm. because the history of yoga is, is very impure it's it's not what we would now call purely hindu i mean the, the hindus the buddhists the jains were indistinguishable from one another quite probably in you know, the distant past two and a half thousand years ago they were characters in their own different ways but with a lot of commonalities trying to find a way out of the problem of, of rebirth mm. in fact just the problem of suffering in human existence which was very often described in those terms village. yeah well less in the villages it seems that most of this happened when urbanization kicked off until that point there was this vedic religion in the northern indian villages that revolved around the fire and the priests were conducting rituals on behalf of the community and they had these funky stories about the gods which may or may not have been dreamed up under hallucinogenic influences um Mm -hmm. but it was a a simple transaction you know you give things to the the deities and in return they provide prosperity in the form of rain good harvests fertility whatnot etc etc whereas um the whole origin of yoga and buddhism and everything else is to say actually that's 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 not how the world works um, actually, there's a problem in the world created by actions. Actions are not something that we do that give us, that by definition, positive results in this lifetime. They're actually a curse <laughs> that sort of ensnare us in this never-ending spiral of, of uh, cause and effect that spirals onwards into the next, you know, infinite... Inf- I can't even think of the right noun from that, the infinity of lifestyles, uh, lifetimes... Um, the life cycles that's the way to look yeah. at it. everything everything is, is is endlessly interconnected and there are different theories of, of how that works in these different uh, traditions that emerge out of that melting pot but they're all basically dealing with the same problem you know wanting things in life um and particularly wanting get you know, something attached to an idea of myself um causes us to suffer because we don't always get what we want and uh, we quite often you know get things that we didn't ask for and in different ways, uh, they've, they've come up with a solution that revolves around the problem being desire, transcending yeah. desire, uh, and therefore there being no effect of acting in the world because there is no you know, sort of negative connotation to not getting what you want. There's no hankering after, you know, addictively after the things that make you feel good. Instead, like, there's just being. <laughs> and, kind of key Buddhist precept of like non-strivance or non-grasping. Yeah, and that's there in all of these traditions in different ways. So there were effectively ways of training the mind, um, or even more so in some cases the body, out of giving in to these these fleeting desires that come and go. Some systems sort of came up with the whole philosophy based around there actually not being a self, and certainly most of Buddhism has that at its core. Whereas a lot of the systems that we think of as Hindu or part of the yoga tradition, they say there's actually something timelessly unchanging that is effectively transcendent, pure consciousness. And all we have to do is perceive from that perspective and everything's solved in an instant. You get this flash of insight and uh, nothing will ever be the same again. Um, However you look at it, it's the same story. The problem is me and it's in my head. And uh, the the only way out of it is to to, to stop getting so caught up in telling all these stories about who I am and who who I think I am in relation to others and in relation to to, to, to what I want out of life. If it's possible just to be, then it becomes a lot simpler. And there's certainly a, a wisdom to that. Uh, it would seem so, as I've discovered in my own endless you know, <laughs> striving and uh, failure to find lasting happiness through getting hold of things or status or money or whatever it might be. Um, or in you know, one time in my life, you know, smoking as much hash as I possibly could. <laughs> Desperate hope that that might get me enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll definitely get you somewhere. Yeah, it, it certainly um, took me to an altered state. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, so perhaps this is a speculative question, but kind of, uh, stepping it back a few minutes ago when you were talking about, um, how Soma, you know, was going around and these kind of mystical states were going on a lot at the time of yoga's origin point. You well, have this is sense. kind of before the origin of yoga, to be honest. The, the, the Soma and the Vedic ritual, that's, we don't really know quite when, but you know, certainly three, four thousand, uh, three, mm, three and okay. a half thousand years ago, I would say. It's uh, a different epoch. Yeah, and whereas a thousand years after the earliest Vedas, we get the ideas that sort of become Buddhism and yoga. Um, so so. Do, you, do you have a sense of how, how these movements and these asanas may have actually emerged and whether whether the individuals who kind of were the first to 
cultivate these postures were, you know, themselves souped up on sort of plant hallucinogens? <laughs> a good question. Um, I, I think unlikely, to be honest. Um, and I think for two reasons. Firstly, that we encounter, if we go to a yoga class today, shapes to put the body into, and that's, that's associated with yoga. Um, more than anything else, though, we associate the word yoga with something we do. It's a practice. And in most of the older texts, looking back into the history of yoga, it, it's not that way at all. Yoga is a state. The state of yoga is something that is attained through various different practices. And for most of the history of yoga, there were no postures. There was just sitting. Um, yoga was meditation. It's defined in, in many early texts simply as that. Uh, when there is a description of a posture, it's to sit straight and uh, sit there as long as you can. Basically. Mm. Eventually stopping the breath in some cases in almost all cases, going beyond the mind. So if you encounter early descriptions of an you know, advanced yogic practitioner, uh, for example, in the Mahabharata, old Indian epic, more than 2,000 years old, I would say, um, you've got uh, somebody being described as like a plank of wood or, or like a stone, basically having no interaction with the outside world, having transcended all uh, sensory engagement with things, <laughs> mm. therefore beyond the mind, beyond any, you know, any, any, any desire in the world, that's a liberated state. You go 1500 years forward from there, even to, to sort of medieval yoga practice texts where they do start to describe different physical positions, the liberated states described in exactly the same way. The yogi is as if dead. <laughs> mm. And uh, these kind of uh, narratives about encountering uh, the yogis outside of the village or something uh, on a hilltop. And they're all sort of, they're in positions in asanas, but they're kind of dead holding them completely still for hours and hours and hours. Well said. Yeah, that's that. I mean, that's the other aspect, I suppose, of the, the, the ancient tradition that we really have very little account of because these guys didn't sit down and write texts about what they were doing. They just did it. Um, but outsiders certainly describe what they saw and were amazed. I mean, going right back to you know, another crowd of people who invaded northern India, the, the ancient Greeks, uh, Alexander the Great came, came, came surging across and uh, he describes seeing these half naked, you know, call them sort of uh, gymnosophists is the term that his, his uh, historians use, uh, sort of uh, philosophical exercises um, mm. involving adopting a difficult position for a long time, standing on one leg or, or lying down under the noonday sun, um, putting yourself through austerities. Uh, there's, 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 there's a couple of terms that get associated with this. Asceticism is this a sort of generic label. Um, which does come from a Greek word originally uh, for exercise or also related to monasticism. Um, and then there's a, a Sanskrit word, uh, tapas, which uh, is there in some of the yoga texts, and that means heat. So it's uh, the generation of inner heat um, for transcendent purposes is, is what doing this difficult stuff with the body was about. But to give us some illustration, I mean, an original yoga pose would be something like this, put your arm in the air and never bring it down ever again leave it up yeah. there until it withers till your fingernails grow into your palm of your hand um, until, until you actually couldn't bring the arm down if you wanted you can only lean forward so it looks that way it's just locked in place the shoulder joints wrecked <laughs> it's to all intents and purposes useless um it's a very stubborn thing to do obviously but um <laughs> it, involves, <laughs> it involves a certain degree of detachment from physical desires if, if, if your arm's yeah. saying this hurts and you're able to just disengage and 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 step into a more expansive sense of you know just being here uh then then that, that that becomes you know something that can liberate you from attachment to the body and uh, perhaps attachment even to the idea of me because that, that's really what the issue is so those early positions seem to be doing something very difficult to the body so that you're no longer identified with it um so there's that going on or just sitting in meditation for a similar reason and the academics have sort of grouped this all together and under and, and weird labels. Uh, my favorite one is immobility asceticism. So the idea of doing as little as possible ever again, that was the original practice of yoga. Because mm. if the problem is action, which causes impacts on the mind, which creates desires, which drives us forward into further action and it spirals endlessly forwards, if you just stop acting, then there is no more a problem. So 
you just sit still, never do anything ever again, effectively starve yourself to death. <laughs> and in some, in some ways, that was, yeah, the, was the ultimate yeah. spiritual practice. Um, Fasting has got to be a kind of key component of that. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, obviously, there was this whole theory of purity and impurity. And just to just to kill yourself was wasn't really it any more than just to, to, to get high on opium and lie down isn't meditation. Um, there's got to be some clarity involved, some awareness. And the picture is clouded to come back to your original question about about drug consumption. I mean, if you go and hang out with modern characters in India, like the people I was talking about at the beginning, the wild men, they still do this sort of stuff, hold an arm in the air or stand on one leg. And they spend half the day, you know, powering through chillums, uh, clay pipes packed with hash and tobacco. Mm. Um, and that certainly helps them detach from, from their bodily discomfort to a certain, to a certain extent. But that wasn't there originally. And uh, when you read early descriptions, or at least as far back as we've got from when the early colonialists from, from the UK showed up in the East India Company and said, what are these characters doing? Um, and interviewed some of them. They, they said, well, you know, I'm just basically patiently submitting to the will of the deity. And uh, once I see this whole thing as devotional kind of offering, um, then there is no problem. Perfectly happy walking around, arms above my head, incapable of doing anything mm. for myself ever again, but you know, everything fine. So it's a very stubborn way of actually doing something quite profound. Um, thankfully, something else happened between then and now, otherwise we wouldn't have yoga classes that we'd want to go to. The sit in the corner until you die workshop or the <laughs> never take your arms down yoga class would be less of a big hit on Instagram. Um, than not going to be the next phrase. Um, <laughs> no. As you described those origins, something about it kind of clicked and made sense for me because I kind of came across meditation and yoga as kind of categorically different practices. Um, meditation yeah. first uh, a few years back and then yoga sometime afterwards. And for me, I've always had this feeling that the two really are a perfect pairing and they're kind of sort of as entangled as two practices can be in a good way um, and really complement one another. So to hear that they kind of have this shared origin point makes an awful lot of sense. They were the same thing, you know, in, in the Mahabharata, that, that's a great epic I was talking about earlier. The, the, uh, the definition of yoga is meditation and it's described in the same way as the Buddha talked about meditation. It says basically there's two kinds of meditation. You can either just concentrate you know, your mind or you can concentrate on the breath. You can control the breath. The breath gives you something to do. So for a long, long time, the main physical practice was either just holding the breath or breathing in a particular way. Mm. Um, there does start to be a shift to doing things with the body because a whole new set of ideas comes into the equation about 1500 years ago, um, generically known as Tantra. Um, well, come on to that in a second but um in terms of sort of the yoga meditation thing uh the texts that are even more recent that do start to teach different positions balancing on your arms twisting bending forwards bending backwards that starts to be really is a way of making it easier to sit for meditation and to sit for long periods mm. of controlling the breath and, and uh, you know, have a more agile body that can withstand some of the you know, the stuff you throw at it when you start trying to hold your breath for, as, as is described in the text, 90 minutes or more. <laughs> yeah, not, not sure how feasible that is, but uh, still, it's, it's there. Um, and they say effectively that the physical practice is there to reinforce what is known in the text as Raja Yoga, which is basically a synonym for getting totally absorbed in meditation, transcending a sense of self, being one with all things. Um, mm. And it said that without that meditative capacity you can't really practice these these physical exercises and yet without the physical exercises it's very hard to get into that state because the body gets sore <laughs> and you, yes. you end up having to stand up so well, the, two, very, the two feed each other very often i'm talking to people who don't have any sort of practice in their life mm -hmm. um and they're kind of hearing about meditation and they're interested in meditation but sitting down for the first time um get an anxious or there's en energy in the body or something like that. And it's very difficult for people to sit still. And what I always find is if you send someone along to a yoga class mm. for 45 minutes or an hour and they get to the end of that class and they've been through all these motions and movements and they've come into that like sort of coherence with the breath, then when they sort of lie down in their um, shavasana mm -hmm. at the end, 
and the sort of instructor is able to give them a sort of guided meditation. People who've never been able to meditate or kind of experience that kind of quiet, calm mind are able to experience it. So one really does complement the other and I would really recommend trying that out. If you're tr thinking of getting into meditation and you're struggling with it, um, have a crack at doing some yoga movements, you know, do a YouTube yoga class or something and then try meditating afterwards and you can really relax into it and sit into the body. Makes a lot of sense because of the early yoga texts, their description of how to do what you've just described is it's brutal. It's the same as the description of how you tolerate holding your arms above your head. It's basically, it's agony at first, but the more you can just chill out, then the less you notice the pain and then after mm. a while it's comfortable. Um, and that, that's really how the, 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 sort of the main yoga philosophy text, the yoga sutra describes how a posture becomes comfortable and steady. Um, you just, eventually stop paying attention to comfort discomfort pain pleasure whatever uh so yeah it's, it's much gentler on the body to go go gradually in, in, in into making it you know, open and, and and relaxed and able to sit in, in uncomfortable positions it is uncomfortable to not move and it's only with a lot of training that it becomes comfortable so the more we can do to loosen up open the hips a little bit uh get some strength in the spine uh, otherwise mm. it's slouch like i tend to do in front of this this device um but yeah with a bit of awareness it, it, it all comes a lot easier and physical yoga practice gives us something to pay attention to it's so much easier to see what you're doing in a position and feel the body you know get get really engaged in all of the cells of the body even than it is just to watch the mind for half a minute people yeah, the simplest way of describing it will pay to go to a yoga class when in London pay getting on for 20 pounds these days to go and have 90 minutes of effectively spiritualized stretching um, and then will never take 90 minutes to sit by themselves uh, even if you know you pay them 20 quid <laughs> it's not <even> <laughs> too much. Yeah. can't do that yeah so it's it's a challenge right. and, and uh, you know and obviously our lifestyles are not very conducive to, to sitting for long periods we've grown up on chairs hunched these days over screens and mm. uh, yeah it's, it's, it's better yeah. to counteract that <laughs> as we are now indeed uh, yeah <laughs> and as much my life is spent working with a computer i really find it, yoga is my saving grace and it's the only thing that really kind of um keeps that flexibility in the body absolutely but, yeah. um something i wanted to kind of tack on to this and maybe i don't know how much we'll talk about it but uh, one of the thinkers that I've been following very closely uh, is a philosopher, John Vivekey. Oh, um, and he's kind of uh, out of the University of Toronto. Uh, sort of, he did a few talks with uh, Jordan Peterson way back, but he's sort of, he's been developing this YouTube series called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Uh -huh. He's kind of doing this grand project and it's like, 50 episodes in now or something wow. with lectures going from like sort of you know ancient greece through you know christianity and buddhism and the enlightenment and now he's kind of bringing in cognitive science and trying to build this sort of um project which is called the uh, the religion that is not a religion so that's what their placeholder is for it but yeah. the reason i bring him up is he has this idea about physical practice and embodied practice being exacted up to cognition. And he practices uh, Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. But when he talked about it, it immediately struck me because I've had a very similar notion about yoga, uh, which I've grappled with, of to what extent does doing this sort of being in these strange, you know, hanging you know, over with your head under your leg sort of thing. And all these interesting positions you're putting yourself in physically. Um, to what extent is that carrying through to like psychological or emotional flexibility in the rest of your life? Again, excellent questions. Eh? Um, uh, I, you know, I, I really think often when I'm thinking about yoga, um, especially in the modern context, uh, the question is, does it work? Um, what does it actually do for us? It, it helps us feel good in our bodies sometimes, but does it really change how we behave? Mm. I think that has to be a separate project. So it's interesting that this, you know, that this concept that you're describing of sort of 
actually acknowledging the need for, 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 for a container in terms of ideas and structure because we've hollowed that out of, of Western culture in all sorts of different ways, not just to do with religion, but the triumph of reason, the idea that we can sort of think ourselves in, 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 you know, into every solution rather than feeling our way sometimes or, or just stopping and, and, and giving space for new things to arise. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to actually shaping what we do, uh, you know, the, the different structures are also needed. You know, we need, we need an intention, we need an ethical framework, we need some sense of, uh, of orientation and, and you know, co common, common agenda in a way. Um, that, uh, that that allows people to work together on on, on something, and 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 that's often lacking in the modern yoga space. There's instead a lot of uh, fluffiness, wooliness, mixing together of traditional ideas with you know, what is generally known as New Age thought. Woo -woo. Uh, yeah, a lot of woo woo, a lot of fantasy. You know, a, a, a lot of that law of attraction kind of you know just visualize the Ferrari and uh, and and manifest it into being. I mean, absolutely sure, you know clarify your intention and focus on what you what you wish to achieve you've got more chance of it happening and being open to the opportunities that come your way but world's chaos it's you know it's a lottery we don't get really much control over what we're dealt with about our only thing that we can control is how we respond to what's in front of us mm. so you know if we actually want to have a framework for what we do once we you know use these practices to put us into a space where we're a bit more capable of responding rather than automatically reacting out of our conditioned tendencies that's from another place. The yoga doesn't teach you how to be a good person. It just gives you a bit more space and clarity so that you can apply yourself in whatever way you might choose. I think, I think the best analogy for this that I can think of is I was involved in editing a book uh, last year called Mac Mindfulness, uh, which is a critique of the modern mindfulness movement and modern, you know, Mac yoga, for want of a better way of putting it, is, is much the same. And there's all these, you know, assumptions about what wonderful transformative power it has, but, uh, it really is just a way of making a bit more space that you can use for any end whatsoever. And a lot of gurus have used the powers that they've developed to abuse their students. Uh, a lot of uh, uses of mindfulness in the, you know, in the modern world uh, are not in any way positive or, or, or constructive or transformative. They're often used to reinforce the status quo. So you might get offered a, a mindfulness mm. class at work to, to chill you out, make it you know, more likely that you stay longer hours and, and work more productively for the corporation rather than demanding better working conditions. Of course, that space could be turned to that end. But if unions have been banned, you haven't got much of a, a starting place. Um, or you can be trained in the US military in mindfulness, you know, sort of attention training effectively to be a more effective shooter. And it's argued that that's more compassionate in the sense that if you're more effective, you don't willy nearly blast you know, your rifle off at the whole village, you choose a few selected people to murder. Um, but that really wasn't you know, what the Buddha had in mind when he was talking about attention training. <laughs> and there's a whole ethical framework in Buddhism. I mean, that's been abused as well in, in World War II. Uh, the, the, the Zen precepts of Japanese Buddhism were turned into a rationale for kamikaze bombing. But still, uh, you know, there is the idea somewhere that there's, there's, a, there's a framework. And that's what we don't have. Modern Western yoga and meditation to a certain extent, as soon as you take it out of a traditional lineage, it's just a tool in a box. But you know, what's, what else is in the yeah. box? I th it feels that there's always these kind of uh, tensions that you've identified with both meditation and yoga, um, which is why I'm so hesitant to talk about this this ability for the physical practice to create cognitive flexibility because it's something that I myself have experienced, but it's very difficult to get away from the sort of the woo woo um, LA yoga instructor that many of us have encountered and is kind of the prevailing image of yoga uh, in a lot of circumstances. Um, what do you identify as wrong with that? What's what, 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 what pushes your buttons about it? About mm. woo -woo? I guess there's a feeling of spiritual bypass mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I get in class with a yoga instructor and I feel that they are, they've gotten a little bit too high off of their own <laughs> supply or something. Uh, and this, it's hard for me to put my finger on, but in a kind of instinctual level, there's something a little bit off uh, very often. 
Well, there's often this language of, you know, you talked about high, I mean, higher vibration is something I'm quite often here. I mean, it's less to do even with yoga circles and more sometimes with, with, with some of the, the other worlds that have started intersecting with them, whether it's, you know, things to do with, 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 with the shamanistic uh, worldviews or, you know, pure psychedelics. But um, there's, 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 there's still some sense of, you know, we're kind of upgrading and that's the project and getting ever higher, <laughs> higher states of consciousness. Um, and the corollary to that is, all negativity needs to just be cleansed out of the way that weighs you down that's baggage you need, 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 need to put that aside as if there's some sort of assumption that we can somehow step into some magical place where we're perfect um on some level we are <laughs> there is something perfect in just the to be quite frank about it fucked up nature of the way things are um but it's not perfect in the sense of, you know, we could just look around us for every, every myriad number of examples we want to pick on of why the world is unfair and why injustice exists and, and why bad things happen. And it's very easy through, through, through using some of that language, which you called yeah, quite rightly spiritual bypassing, to sort of make it sound like, like we either just turn our backs on all of that and don't care about it, or, or we suggest in some way implicitly, and that's there often in, in the way that, mindfulness and yoga get used in a modern neoliberal capitalist society it sort of suggests that the people who are experiencing hardship just 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 haven't blissed out enough they haven't they, yes. they haven't manifested their higher truth yet they really need to you know go go go, go pop a few of these whatever that might be or, or do a bit more of that or let go just you know stop don't hang on to all your negativity man stop bringing us all down and uh that's it. Yeah, that's, that's a problem. But then also there's yes. a corollary the other way where you get all these sort of social justice activists who, who turn everything into an example of why there is injustice and we must dismantle all of these structures. And there's almost an implication that everything that yoga and meditation offers is empty uh, because injustice still exists. Um, and that's not true either. That's, that's it. They're all jumping to extremes in different ways. Yeah, there's a feeling of kind of the sort of fundamental of, of suffering or, you know, pain or difficulty in reality is being taken out of the picture. And you also have to wonder to what extent, as you're saying, muck mindfulness, the kind of, um, the purchase of the market on these kinds of things, what kind of incentive does that have if you are, um, you know, uh, making an enormous amount of money with your yoga classes <laughs> and you're also doing some life coaching or whatever on the side to a certain extent there's a lot oh, yeah. of people who you know are well off and willing to pay money to to have someone who's gonna give them an enormous amount of positivist energy yeah and not many people maybe are gonna pay to <laughs> to be confronted <laughs> to be confronted or to talk about the suffering or the shadow or something things well, of that no, nature. That's, that's it but uh, i am quite inspired these days and it's not really come from the yoga world it's come from some of these other places i was, was talking about um there is an interest in in, in, in looking at the collective shadow and then uh, you know, what we might mm. do about it and you know some of these some of these sort of philosophical movements that uh you were, you were alluding to in the one you were describing obviously seem to be quite well anchored in, in understanding that we have to take a much bigger view of things than, than, than just sort of what effectively is a recreating of the problem if it's you know, focusing on my happy bubble <laughs> or even if we try and expand my happy bubble to be the entire world it's still a happy bubble and the world isn't a happy bubble the world mm. is a com you know, complex interplay of, of, of darkness and light um, and as soon as we start to, to, to pretend that it isn't that way, we've, you know, we've created a fantasy land, unfortunately. And that's where the rainbows and the unicorns come in. And uh, it's all very lovely. But uh, there's an easier way to get there. And you know, I used to enjoy it. You just get high and stop trying to turn it into a philosophy. <laughs> you just enjoy yourself if that's what you want to do. But yeah. if you're going to turn it into a philosophy, then it has to engage with the reality of uh, you know, life being difficult. And I think the simplest way of doing that, that one of my teachers sort of reduced to this little maxim, uh, yeah, pain exists, but suffering is optional. So stuff happens to us in life that hurts. So There's just no way of getting around that. And quite apart from anything else, we die. And most of us uh, uh, yeah, uh, pains to avoid that at, <laughs> at some level. Um, but a lot of the anguish that causes us to, to, to suffer day to day is, is self-generating. Uh, it's stories about discomfort mm. and 
I mean, you talked earlier about being able to sit in meditation. That's that's training the body to actually withstand discomfort, which also then trains the mind to actually be able to allow discomfort to exist, to allow injustice to exist, but also to bring clarity to face it and think about well, what might we do instead, or what might I do to stop causing myself additional anguish. Let's say you know you, you discovered one part of your body just doesn't work anymore. You've could become paralyzed down one side. You're not going to be able to get the use of the leg back, but you can stop you know, being depressed about it. Um, that's, that's certainly a good start. Uh, so these practices give us some agency uh, in you know, how we mm. engage with reality, um, but then also actually make it possible to face the complexity of everything, the messiness, uh, things just as they are. Things are just as they are. Uh, and no amount of trying to mm. prettify them st- stops them being as they are. Uh, we're just, as you say, bypassing it in the end if we, if we come up with the story of how it's all lovely. Being being with what is, is how I would characterize it. And it's kind of a a simple phrase, but one with a lot of depth to it that you can really um, explore through different kinds of practices. Um, and I think you're quite right to point to sitting with discomfort in well, I've learned. Of, mm, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, that project of dealing with the shadow, dealing with the shadow within oneself, and also mm. dealing with the suffering within the world. Um, you know, yoga, meditation, psychedelics, any other kind of psychotechnology or tool that you're using are not going to get you to the promised land. But what they might do is provide you with a circumstance or a training wheel in order to give you that tolerance and that grit so that when you're confronted with difficulty in life or challenge or kind of pathological thinking within yourself, you're able to kind of really be with it and fully experience what that is. And that's deeply informative. I think so. You know, I've had to learn this the hard way. I've uh, spent you know, l- large parts of my life uh, trying to think my way out of discomfort and made my discomfort much worse. Um, I think that really came you know, to, 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 to a crisis point for me when I was much younger, which is probably what led me into chronic cannabis addiction as it became, mm. uh, which was, was freaking out on acid and uh, not being able to deal with the sort of the dissolution of everything in front of my eyeballs, including my eyeballs, and <laughs> just somehow <laughs> there was everything that I wanted to hang on to. This this fantasy about me, you know, the the, 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 the clever Cambridge educated uh, achievement monkey who was walking the accelerated upward path to goodness knows what. But you know, as so long as it felt upward, I, I felt good about myself. Uh, was suddenly in bits around me, and I was uh, engaged in this stupid project. You know, age nineteen sat in my bedroom with my mind all over the place trying to conjugate you know bits of French in order to try and reassure myself that I hadn't lost my mind and, and all that happened was everything just it was like you know everything I tried to hold on to just disappeared through my fingers and uh, I spent the next few years chronically anxious and, and smoking a lot of dope chilled me out but at that time that's when I first tried some meditation I bought a book that was called experience beyond thinking and um it stuck with me that title and I realized over the years that, that, that mm. I was incapable of doing that. Had I just been able to be with that experience without thinking about it, it was, it was a, you know, a troubling moment um, and it passed. You know, everything passes eventually if you just sit there and watch it, uh, including this life. Um, so it's also worth getting up and doing something too, uh, before it's gone. <laughs> but at the same time, yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I wasn't able to do that. And, uh, it took me a long time to, 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 to see the, you know, the clarity of that. In fact, it's probably about 15 years later on a silent retreat when almost recreated all sorts of psychedelic drugs fueled experiences for myself, just through sitting there for, you know, by day seven of this retreat, you know, mm. doing 12 hours or so of sitting a day, it was, uh, suddenly my body was doing all sorts of things. And I said, it was like, I recreated the moment and it was, ah, oh, I just have to watch. And, uh, the thinking was, was adding to the problem, which isn't to say that thinking is a bad thing. You can get involved in all sorts of worldviews that, that, that explain, you know, the ego is the enemy or thought is the problem and just let it all unfold. And you know, that, that works for some people, especially the devotionally inclined, no, no, no faster track than to just you know, say, it's all the will of the deity unfolding through me. I'll just submit and 
get on with my life from that perspective and feel guided. Um, fortunately, my mind doesn't work that way. Yeah, I'm too much of a rationalist, but the, the, the rational capacity for thought was causing me a lot of problems until I started to see that there's, there's, there's a way of being just without adding to it with the voice in the head all the time and to then see that thought can be a useful tool, but it wasn't a tool, it was in charge. It was like this autopilot part of me that was interested in defining myself was running the show. And, 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 and there's another place that's, I mean, I suppose that's where the language of higher comes in. It is a slightly higher wisdom. It's less caught up in this uh, mm. egoic defense mechanism. But going back to what you're saying about the shadow, you know, the, the, the whole of our culture is built on egoic defense mechanism. <laughs> and uh, there's a different you know, resistance to, to facing that. We've instead developed all sorts of other things to do to hide from our discomfort, whether it's addiction to substances, shopping, pointless distractions online, or, or, or what used to be TV, you know, or the thing in the pocket that now you know, keeps us transfixed all day long. That's, yeah, that one is enormously distracting. Um, even in, you know, for me, I've been practicing for several years, uh, with an awareness of how distracting it is. And it's still, uh, an ongoing challenge for me. Same. I mean, we live in the world and it's easier in a way to renounce the world, to go and live in the cave. It's depressing. Um, but if you do all that practice, it becomes easier. And if you join a community where that's accepted, basically take monastic vows, whichever tradition you wander off into, food's provided you do you do your thing you're on a sort of spiritual high and it's it's one way of coping with life but um living in the world is, is yeah it's it's more what they talk about in various uh, texts as walking the razor's edge there is this uh, you know, very fine line between you know, getting it too far one way and too far the other uh, we're trying to find a balance between a bit of discipline and also trying to enjoy this life before it's gone um i've, I've done a lot of you know, overdoing the self self discipline in a way of trying yeah. to get myself under control. I thought that was the answer, and all this yoga practice, keep going to India four six hours a day of asana practice. That was, you know, so somehow I would everything would line up, and it, you know, all, all the traffic lights would be in sequence, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and the big white light in the third eye would start vibrating. But there's, uh, there's, that way. <laughs> there's this kind of uh, rigid disciplinary flavor, I think, that can come out uh, with meditation, and certainly. Um, in some cases it can be used as a way to kind of bypass dealing with the emotions. Um, exactly. and it can be like a way of controlling your emotions rather than sitting with, um, what's coming up. Absolutely. I think what you said about sort of being or the being mode, uh, is very pertinent and something that I've been, um, sitting with a lot as well because we all kind of have these conscious streams of thought in our head and throughout the day, making observations and judgments and assessments and having ideas about things. Um, and these voices very often have come from, you know, they could be coming from the school teacher we had when we were younger, or they can be coming from um, mom or dad or social environment. And if we don't have that break, where we come into the being mode rather than the, you know, wanting or thinking. Yeah. And we don't have the possibility to recognize that that's what that is. And then maybe over a bit of time, you know, with awareness of it, there's a possibility of changing it a little bit. Yeah. In a direction that's maybe more true to ourselves rather than the kind of, characters or the masks that we've developed in relationship to our developmental environment and you know what culture we grew up in and all of those different factors yeah right i think a lot of the time we don't actually recognize how much we're on autopilot and that's 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 one of the biggest lessons i suppose from practice is, is to just be able to, to to see as you say how, you know, how much of this stuff isn't ours but also how, how little choice we've actually exercised so growing up in a culture that valorizes the individual and prioritizes free will and, and tries to say that, you know, everything we're doing is revolving around empowered choices. You know, even the, the fantasy that our political system is somehow influenced by which, which, which box we tick. Um, 
uh, it's it, it, you know it's, it's largely an illusion. There, there there are many structures in place that we have very little influence over, and we're not really very conscious of not uh, having chosen directly for ourselves. Um, and the more aware we get of that, and the easier it becomes to start thinking about what we might do about it, and and, and also acknowledging, firstly, on the one hand, how little power we have. Um, you know, the the grand sort of sweep of, of world history and all of the forces assembled pushing things in a certain direction make it very hard to turn around and try and push back um, and yet at the same time we do have agency we can do what we can um, so I think I started to learn this from you know, my attempts at dabbling in activism and, and you know I had these grandiose notions again my ego leapt in and you know wanted to fix the whole world and mm. uh, you know, that was the fantasy of our, our music festival in the Balkans all those years ago um, and then, you know, in different ways, you know, trying to dismantle capitalism or stop climate change or you know, any any other <laughs> sort of wonderful fantasy, but you know, very difficult to enact proposition. Um, it's it's possible to go again from one extreme to another and think it's all pointless. But you know, what we do has consequences, mm. know, and we can make these decisions for ourselves and see 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 more wisely how to behave. And and, and really, on on the very personal level, just just to see that we actually do have a story and it's worth investing in creating a story that we're happy with, that we're living, but we don't need to be so hung up on it. It's not, it's not, it's not who we are, but we have to live a role if we're actually going to be part of the world. As soon as we don't sit in the cave all day long, we're adopting a persona, we're doing something for a living, we're interacting with people in certain ways, we're prioritizing our time to be here, not there. And so there's all sorts of decisions gone into it and, and it's better to own that and, you know, and try and shape it as, as best we can with an acceptance that we don't get to control the outcome. Um, we can only really control where we invest our attention, our clarity of intention and, and our effort, but you know, where it leads, totally beyond our control, I think. And, you know, it's mm. been very difficult for me to accept that in my life, but as I get older, I wouldn't say wiser, but you know, <laughs> kind of more aware of my failings and, 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 and where they've come from, I start to see that it's got a lot to do with that. And it's liberating to, to stop thinking that you've got this control over the outcome, frees you up to have some control over doing stuff and you know, having yes. a go, playing, yeah. enjoying, enjoying the effort and, 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 and seeing where it goes. And ultimately, Doesn't... that's what the physical yoga practice can help with. It's doing really difficult things with the body, making an effort without really caring. It doesn't matter whether it looks good. It doesn't matter if you nail it. It doesn't matter if you're going backwards, but you know, really applying yourself with effort without any real attachment to it. The weird balancing act of mm. two things that are paradoxically pulling in opposite directions. Yes, paradox is the word that was on the tip of my tongue. Uh, as you're saying that, there's this kind of paradoxical quality to change, and how very often our desire to change things is the obstacle <laughs> to really, like, in a sense, we have to really become aware of the situation, have fully accepted it, whatever it is, in order to then. Um, reach the possibility of changing it yeah. and you can kind of I mean, there's a great wisdom and as you're kind of alluding to bringing it back to yourself your immediate domain your personal life your relationships mm -hmm. and that is a kind of place where you can realize yeah how difficult it is first of all to to achieve change mm -hmm. and how much work very often there is just to become aware of and sit with the reality of um, the world around you but this kind of carries up to, I think, some of the broader like meta crises we're facing in terms of climate. Um, I guess my strong critique or my sense that something's going wrong with sort of the extinction rebellion end of things mm -hmm. is that there's so much push to change and there's so much push to resolve and save the planet without the actual kind of real sitting with and integrating the emotional reality of the damage that's done and to a certain extent i believe we have to like we have to accept the outcome where we've fucked it all up mm -hmm. fully like take that and like really feel in your body that 20 30 40 years down the line there's a real potential for a complex series of different interlinking crises to create an absolute disaster that's disruptive to all of our lives. And then from there, 
having really taken that in, move to the possibility of change. Whereas where I see a lot of is like anxiety because people can feel it going on on some level and then trying to change it without having really sat with and taking it on. Well, most revolutions recreate the previous state of quo with greater violence for precisely that reason. Um, that you know, it's very hard to actually change tendencies in, in, in human nature, and, and unless that's really the objective, it's very hard to get anywhere. But obviously, time is short, so I can sympathise with activists who think, you know, "Full steam ahead, let's just get it acknowledged how serious this, this mess is, and then try to do something about it." it would be nice to have a spiritual transformation in the process because that might make it more you know, sustainable, whatever bodged up solution we can cobble together in the time remaining, but we need to get something happening yesterday. So we should be doing mm. it already. Um, however, as you say, I mean, ultimately whatever happens um, until there is no more life on earth, people have got to find a way to live with themselves and each other. And I think in some ways, yeah, I, yeah, I don't really know as a teacher of yoga and I wouldn't really call myself a teacher as such. <laughs> I, I facilitate the odd class, but you know, the, 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 there isn't really a context to, to do that in a yoga class situation. People come and they want to move and they want to feel their bodies, but there's a need for this other container that I was alluding to some, some sort mm -hmm. of space where ideas are discussed and, and it's possible to, to, to um, work on oneself and one's relationship to oneself and the world on that broader level, accepting what is in some ways so that we might do something slightly more constructive with what remains. Um, but it's, 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 it's very difficult to see where that can be facilitated at the moment. There aren't those spaces that, that, that we need. I think the church used to provide a certain amount of that social glue for a long time. You know, the fact that there were three or four TV channels could provide quite a lot of it and you could seed, you know, a real shift in people's understanding through, through, you know, a good, a good TV program. Um, there are some parts of the internet that have that degree of influence now. I mean, you alluded to Joe Rogan. I don't even know how many million people consume what he puts out, but it's, it's a lot. Um, so yeah, there's, there is the possibility to shape conversations. I guess that's why we're talking and that's what interests us both. And then, you know, in our little ways in our, in our worlds, we're, we're already engaged in that. And we know others who are engaged in it even more than we are, but I don't see it on the scale that I'd like to see it. And I don't, no. really, know, I don't really know how to try and influence that scale other than to yeah, acknowledge it needs to happen and to, to, to talk about it. I think the sort of container you allude to, is really the the project of right now mm -hmm. in a sense rather than the, the sort of addressing of the individual crises the climate crises um and the you know large combination of other crises which are intermeshed with that it's what we're doing right now kind of brought up to the level of larger groups of people which are kind of interconnected and self-organizing um, and figuring out how do we come together, come into some sort of communion with one another, where mm -hmm. our individual um, shadows and pet peeves and things are not derailing everything, um, and where we can really create the conditions for a more... Oh, um, should I use the word elevated? Maybe not a more elevated um, conversation. Well, if it's in relation to conversation, I think you absolutely can, because the level of conversation that goes on on social media, which is where most people expend a lot of their talking energy these days, is dying. Mm. It's, very, it's very difficult to have a conversation, in fact. There's a lot of shouting at one another or uh, passive-aggressive talking at one another or polite ignoring of each other, but there's very little genuine interaction of, 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 of you know, being forced out of your comfort zone to, to try and engage with an alternative point of view and to see if there's some way of harmonizing these two things that are never going to marry perfectly. Um, and uh, you know, that's, that's something ironically that I think is there in, in the Extinction Rebellion project, this desire for a citizens assembly that's sort of been granted that doesn't really have any teeth. Um, but just the actual mechanism of getting a, a group of people together to talk seriously about stuff in a facilitated way from what i've seen i've got a friend who has been making films about these things and he's shown me and talked to me a lot about about how these things work that, that people with 
radically different opinions are able to actually sit around the table, politely mm. disagree with each other, hear the evidence to, for, for, for different points of view, and actually be swayed by evidence to reaching a group decision, a bit like you know a jury trial. Um, obviously, it's flawed, but it's, uh, it's a lot less flawed than just, I've got my point of view, I'll listen to the evidence that seems to support it, and I'll dismiss everything else that could lead to a different point of view as biased. Um, and, and, and if we could at least just have a space where that happened in other ways, even just for fun, you know, it doesn't need to be about the weighty problems of the day, but you know, talking yeah. club <laughs> would, be, would be a start. Yeah, I, there's a, a lot of different small communities and networks that are kind of engaging in this in project in different ways. I think you're right. Um, yeah. And as you are kind of threading it back to the start of this conversation, when we're talking about practice, um, I've begun to conceive recently of, of conversation as a practice as well. Mm. Um, and I thought one thing that would be useful for us to do is to kind of consider what is the difference between a practice and sort of, just something that you do yeah. and this way in which having a practice um, has this kind of building quality to it and it's kind of feeding into the rest of your life and there's not really a defined end goal. It's a bit, you know, I, I'm sure there are people who are listening to this who hear the word practice and think practicing for my GCSE maths exam or something like that. Well, it also, you know, always sounds very results oriented. You know, you've got, got some outcome in mind as soon as you're practicing or, 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 or it sounds like a dress rehearsal rather than the real thing. It's, it's, those are two connotations that jump to my mind straight away. But I think there's one thing I feel like I, I, I should acknowledge and it's, it's, I can only really talk for myself here, but I've engaged in these practices as I was alluding to because my life was a mess <laughs> and, and I didn't really know how to get on with it um, and I didn't really know how to live with myself. Um, I see a lot of other people who are actually able to live with themselves and who've been through a lot more than I've been through and who don't seem to find the need for these kinds of practices. They, they, they find some way of finding their centre just instinctively. Um, so uh, it's not to suggest that everybody has to engage in this or that I'm in some way more elevated because I do what I do. In some ways, it's, you know, it's, it's how I have found the possibility of muddling through my existence. Um, and it may not work for others, and they may, may have, they may just find it an encumbrance and a necessary extra step. They may already be doing many of the things that, that I've slowly, at the age of forty-five, muddled my way towards. Um, but I think, practically speaking, to get back to the term practice, uh, the sort of missing link of what I was talking about in yoga history is this idea of tantra, and, and, and um, I just like to mention that for a moment because I, I think it's relevant. Um, Obviously, in the modern context, the word tantra, you just stick it into Google and look at the first page of images. It's it's all to do with it sex. means sex to everybody who hears the word. Absolutely. And, 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 and not just sex, but spiritual sex, transformative sex. And, you know, so some, way, so some, way, some way of disguising your kinky massage business as, as, as a, a, an agent of awakening. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'll finger you for 200 quid and you'll get enlightened. Um, so it's... it's, it's, it's and you know it's all supposedly connected to ancient Indian tradition, and there are Indian texts called tantras that do talk about sex, um, mm. but but in a very different way. <laughs> it's it's pretty hardcore. I mean, it's, it's it's drunken orgies in cremation grounds to summon deities to possess you, um, because the whole of the idea of tantra is that that in some way everything is a manifestation of the divine, including our bodies, including all of the darkness, um, mm. and therefore one can use the most impure things possible. So going to the exact opposite extreme of the priests of keeping everything per pristine, behaving in a certain upright way, controlling what you eat, who you talk to, who you associate with, and they say, go, no, full speed into all the things that are banned uh, and, and use the impurity as a way of creating purity of mind. Because the ultimate purpose of it all is actually to become the divine, to, to, well, to step into the divine, divine that is already in us in the form of the energy and consciousness that animates us. So that's the real sort of philosophy of Tantra. And once that entered into the yoga tradition, this whole beat the body into submission or sit still forever, approach to practice disappeared it became a lot more dynamic these other shapes came in because there was an idea of opening up subtle channels in the body working with energies using physical techniques to dissolve the mind in meditation um, and really more importantly than anything coming back to what we were talking about 
everyday life in all of its messiness is just as good a way to wake up to reality um, as sitting in silent meditation mm. observing yourself it's just harder uh, and in buddhism there seems to be an idea that the tantric path is you know, sometimes presented as the most elevated you can get you enlightened in this lifetime but it's the most difficult um, much easier to just you know, observe your precepts as a monk sit in meditation and, and you know there's there's some structure to it so practice really i think gives a structure to things but it's not real life at the same time and somehow to build this bridge between the slightly artificial thing that one does as training uh, and living one's life in a way that's actually informed by that is the big challenge and, and hardly anybody teaches it and in fact you know, it's, it's the one sort of missing link it's often assumed that a lot of the the new agey posturing in the yoga world is, is, is built on the assumption that you know you just follow my vinyasa flow and you're getting into this space where you'll become a nicer kinder person actually it's not true at all most people do that at lunchtime and then go back to 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 to, to their you know, world destroying desk job <laughs> don't think about it too much and fair enough i mean we all do that to a certain extent we detox from the toxifying life that we inhabit uh, and then get back on with it again but um, I think the real challenge then is to see how we can live in the world as a practice and, uh, and, 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 and realize that it isn't in its end a practice apart from paying attention. That's mm. really the only practice. Uh, as one teacher put it to me recently, paying attention with awareness, and it's, he called it bright awareness even. That's how he distinguished the ultimate yogic state of being beyond the mind, not caught up in ideas of me from an overdose of opiates uh, where you're just you know, oh, zombified. Um, there's this clarity involved and, and, and for most of us, it's hard to cultivate. So a little bit of something at certain points in the day makes it more easy to tap into it in these other moments when yes. it's caught up in the flow of stuff. And that's why I bother to get up in the morning and do what I do. Um, whether it's made me that much different as a person, it's very hard to say, but I feel better for doing it. So I hope it's building more of a bridge than I would otherwise have, but I really don't know. I mean, we can't prove this stuff scientifically because it's an experiment we do on ourselves. It's not replicable easily, you know, in a, a large sample group where we could also do a controlled trial with somebody having placebo. In fact, it is a giant placebo to a certain extent. Mm. Um, we're, 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 we're having this effect on ourselves. Almost, it's not hypno hypnosis as such, but training ourselves through focused attention to actually mean what we say and say what we mean. Uh, and if we can do that, that's already seemed to me a good good start. Because that's a great turn of the phrase. Yeah. Most of us have a good intention, but it, it goes awry. <laughs> so I just got one more thing I want to tack on to your, your Tantra notion, which mm. I felt like really threaded into this idea of conversation as practice, because it's really, you know, it's not just the good conversations or, you know, the conversation we're having now, it's all of those interactions um you know the interaction with the very larry person on the street who you never would talk to that's yeah. also sort of an encounter with an aspect of reality Absolutely. that you have to take in and kind of deal with within yourself and um kind of taking it back even another step before conversation um for me when i see people on the street just that physical encounter as you're walking past someone um, very often, because I'm in England, nobody's looking up. They're all <laughs> looking down. <laughs> sure. And I'm the only one that's sort of kind of openly looking into their faces. And sometimes you get a, you know, smile and a hello. Sometimes you don't. But that's part of the well, texture of reality. Where I grew up, you yeah. get uh, what you're looking at. And so I train myself to look at the floor <laughs> oh, yeah. because uh, yeah, I risk getting beaten up otherwise. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, part of the texture of of reality and it seems to me that part of this enterprise it, this kind of spiritual enterprise is to experience as much of reality as truthfully as we can yeah and yet at the same time you know um take william blake and as if the doors of perception were cleansed everything would appear to man as it truly is infinite and like on the acid trip or whatever other psychedelic that somehow dissolves this, this filtering system that stops us being totally overwhelmed by the amount of information out there. Our brain can only handle a small amount of it. Um, we can only take a certain amount of truth and that's okay. But 
mm. I guess it's just just to try and as you say it's just that orientation the, the the willingness to be open to as much as we can tolerate and uh, yeah be kind to ourselves in the process as well it's not it's, it's this there's no one watching on high giving us marks <laughs> and you're really, you're really judging this as us. So if we're making our experience hell through trying to be good at practice, which I've done, um, it doesn't serve us very well. Uh, it's, yeah, we've got to live in this mind and body. So we're trying to do it skillfully, um, but it can easily turn into another way of beating ourselves up. That feels like a really good place to draw things to a close, I think. Okay, well, it's been a pleasure chatting to you. Yeah, I nice really to, enjoyed this. I think continue in one of these shared spaces that you were telling me about. Yeah, absolutely. I'll have you back on and um, I look forward to it. Cool. Well, thank you for getting in touch. Uh, pleasure to talk. And uh, I hope it's brighter with you than it is here. It's pretty grim here today. Yeah, it's actually too bright where I'm sitting. So. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'll take some of that brightness in and thank you very much. Oh, namaste. Stay tuned. Have a good day. Right.